let's go to Exodus 19. Exodus is really when the nation started. The nation of who? The nation of Israel. But of course, we have to understand that everything happens for a reason, and God wants us as disciples to be his holy nation. Can I get an amen? Amen! amen. The holy nation of God, what is it? Where did it originate? A lot of us remember it from our first principles class in Light and Darkness. It is the church, the holy nation, the holy people, the chosen people. You go from darkness into his wonderful light. So I'm going to show you a scripture that actually first Peter came from. All right. And uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 3, it says, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain. This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and yeah. brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. First Peter is actually a fulfillment scripture of Exodus 19. Little did you know, Exodus 19 mentions the church, the kingdom of God, because he's not talking about the Levitical priesthood because only Levites were priests. He's talking about all people being priests. Every disciple is a priest of God in the kingdom. What is the role to make right with the Lord? So disciples, you are a priest. You're a holy nation. You're a treasured possession. And I don't want to be anybody else but this guy right here in the presence of the kings and queens of the kingdom of God. And of course, as God's holy nation, we need to understand that God's holy nation needs a very strong foundation. And who's our very strong foundation? Jesus. Who's our very strong foundation? Jesus. And as a church, we get so new school, you know what I'm talking about? We want to we want to we want to do more and and reach more people. Sometimes we forget the old school foundations. Right? We start branching out doing these crazy things as I've experienced. I want to win more souls and it's very dangerous to start branching out and forgetting you're building on the foundation, which happened 2000 years ago, the old school of old school. If we stop building on the foundation of Jesus, we start doing our own thing. It gets really discouraging and really weird. And you know, you, you stop winning as many people, but we know God wants to win all people. So this lesson, this study is called strengthen the foundation of God's holy nation. Let's go, bro. Come on. As the church grew in the first century, we're going to dive into Hebrews a little bit, intertwine this lesson with Hebrews. And Hebrews was written to an audience that seemed to be loosening on the foundational convictions on how to build God's holy church. I believe Hebrews is a book that teaches perseverance and dedication to the sound doctrine given by the apostles in Jesus Christ himself. It's a book that was written decades after the start of the church and people started drifting. So as you grow in the faith, you're going to be more and more tempted to do your own thing because you feel things aren't as successful. You think maybe you have a better idea than God and I've been there and that is a bad idea. Trust me. So today I want to go back to the foundation of the church, the foundation of God's holy nation. Of course, Hebrews is a book about strengthening the foundation of God's holy nation. We cannot strengthen the foundation of God's kingdom of his nation without going into the Old Testament. Amen? Amen. So let's go all the way back to 2 Chronicles chapter 33. Point number one, grace is found in the ground. Again, you know, the rhymes will always keep coming up in this. And uh, I, I grew up, I loved uh, music, poems, uh, rap. I used to be a battle rapper. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, I wasn't the best. I was probably one of the worst in the world. But you know what? I was still a battle rapper. And coming into the kingdom, I was able to take some of those rhyming skills and put them into the scriptures that I read. So grace is found in the ground. In uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 33, we see the nation of God was starting and, and, and God brought David in and he unified the nations. But then in time, they started going back to old ways or even trying to create new ways of trying to build a foundation of God's kingdom. So we pick up with a king of Judah that did some devastating things to the foundation of God's nation. Verse one, Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. For those of you who think you're too young to be a disciple, this guy was 12 years old leading a kingdom. 
He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nation the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had demolished. He also erected altars to the Baals and made Asherah poles. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshiped them. He built altars and in the temple of the Lord of which the Lord had said, my name will remain in Jerusalem forever. In both courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry host. He sacrificed his children. And the fire of the valley of Ben-Hanom practiced divination and witchcraft, sought omens and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing God's anger. I mean, come on, this guy lost all foundation of biblical principles. And he started building the kingdom of the Lord on practices found in the world okay keep reading with me here let's keep reading um verse 21 now manasseh passes he actually ends up repenting and trying to change things but it was by that time too late and then amon who was 22 years old verse 21 when he became king king reigned in jerusalem two years he did evil in the eyes of the lord as his father manasseh had done amon worshiped and offered sacrifices all the idols that Manasseh had made, but unlike his father, he did not humble himself before the Lord. Amnon increased his guilt. So years and years and years of decimating God's temple, filling it with false idols. Asherah pole is a giant erected men's organ, okay? And they put that in the temple of the Lord. False idols, witchcraft, omens. That's what the temple was filled with. And by this time, it's just, just imagine the decimation of God's holy foundation. Now we go to uh, 2 Chronicles 34. So the temple is now buried by idols. And our common knowledge or our common idols would be school books, sin, family, work and money, the desire for fame, the American dream, witchcraft, drug use, alcohol, all of those things. Imagine your temple, the, the, the temple of God, just filled with all those things. And that's what the world has founded their faith on. Come on. Like Kahari so eloquently shared, he started being tempted to build his faith on money. And imagine all of that happening in the temple of God, but times 10. That's the condition we're at in 2 Chronicles 34. Right. Now check out the time as it unfolds. Verse 1 of 2 Chronicles 34 says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king. There we go. Never too young to become a king in the kingdom of God. And he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. And the eighth year of his reign, so that's eight years later. So we're talking, how old is he now? Eight plus eight, 73. No, I'm just kidding. 16 years old. So eight years has gone by. While he was still young, Amen. If you're 18, you are still young or 16. You're still young. And he began to seek the God of his father and the 12th year. Okay. So now old is he? How old is he? 12 years later. He's 20 years old. He began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of its high places in Asherah Polo. So 12 years, the whole nation of Israel is just covered by idols. Imagine 12 years of your walk with God, no foundation on the scriptures. They just drifted so far. Now Josiah is seeking God and 12 years in, he goes, oh my gosh, I've got to do the purge here. This is horrible. And this is what happens when disciples try to do new things, forgetting the old. This is what happens when Christians try to recreate how to win souls over because they're trying to be relatable. Little do they know they're abandoning the foundation of the church of God. 12 years later, go with me to verse, um, verse eight. Uh, in the 18th year of Josiah's reign, to purify the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, son of Azaliah, and Messiah, the ruler of the city, with Joah, son of Joaz, the recorder to repair the temple of his God. Now, 18 years later, now he's how old? 26 years old. Now he's starting to repair the temple. So 18 years later is when he starts working on the temple. How long is it going to take for you to work on the temple? How long is it going to take for you to get that foundation stronger? How long is it going to take for you to start remembering the first principles and applying it not only in mind, but in heart and in action? How long will it be until you remember to purify the temple with the foundation of God's holy nation? 
So we go down to verse 14. Now they start cleaning it out. Oh my gosh, Asherah Paul, these idols, witchcraft, you know, we got all this craziness and they're cleaning it out. Verse 14, while they were bringing out the money that had been taken into the temple, Hokiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that had been given to Moses. Hokiah said to the Shaphan, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord buried under the rubble in the ground. The word of God was found in the ground. Grace is found 26 years old years and years go by and they go oh my gosh the foundation of god's holy nation i finally found how to build the kingdom of god the only way to build god's church the only way for it to sustain is through the scriptures alone not cool music not relatable culture the word of god and the church said amen You cannot lose the conviction to build your life on the scriptures through the Holy Spirit, from the Father, through the Son. That's what happens to nations, cultures, and peoples. When they used to seek God, now they seek glory. You can't change or manipulate God's way of doing things. 18 years later, Then the word of God was found. Within the ground, the word was found. They found the Bible in the temple of God. As disciples, we understand what the temple is. It's the church. It's you. You are the temple. Have you buried the word of God under idols? Have you buried the word of God under laziness? Have you buried the word of God under school, under work, under money? Do you have to go far? Do you have to start clearing it out? But I want to ask you, don't do it 18 years later. Do it now. Do it now. Get into your hearts. Because the only way to survive, the only way to thrive is through the word of God alone. And disciples, you cannot drift. You got to get those idols out so you can truly be welcomed in to the kingdom in heaven. No, I really appreciate Steve and Angie. Incredible servants. Incredible servants. And I love Angie's heart. Steve told me she's a little bit down today. And I said, why? No, Angie's never down. This is Angie down, by the way, like guacamole sticks. I need to imitate. And he goes, well, she just, she was sad she couldn't be there last night. And I said, that is a heart. She was sad because she couldn't be a part of the core of building this church. And I looked at him and I said, that's the heart. And she's doing awesome, bro. And every time we come up to visit Gainesville, she's talking about one thing building the temple of the Lord. Such a special spirit, and we praise God and congratulate you as being appointed shepherds in the Kingsville Church. And, uh, you know, last night I was like, I was trying to drink some water, and Steve comes up and says, bro, i got to talk to you about something. I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, I have to sit down for this. Of course, you got to sit down before your elders, amen? And I just came, he sat down right next to me, and he shared his quiet time for about 20 minutes. This is a man and a woman that understands the foundation of God's right. holy nation. Amen. And I remember when they come to be a part of the Gainesville church and how it happened. Of course, part of the foundation of God's church is persecution, amen? And he, Steve heard some persecution and he goes, oh, that sounds familiar. I should go visit. What was familiar? We were persecuted because we were preaching the truth of God's word. Steve and Angie then placed memberships after some prayers and some scriptures and some conversations. We're so grateful for God to help build the foundation of God's nation through the Middletons. Now, Joe and Amelia are the same way. They've got the word of God deep in their hearts. And Matthew 13, 44 says the kingdom of God is found in the ground. Luke 8 says the soil is the heart. So your heart is the modern day temple of God. And your heart amongst one another is the kingdom of God. So my question to you, are you ready for grace to be found in the ground of your hearts? I just want to encourage you. A lot of you have come up to me saying, you got something missing. There's something going on. There's something lacking. And the answer is no, it's not. The Holy Spirit is within you. That means you lack not one thing. 
You just got to let the word of God clear out the things that are taking place of the word and make room for the scriptures so you can be powerful in God's grace. This reminds me of a brother. His name's Paris Grant. And Paris was baptized at the beginning of summer. And no, it's not Paris, France. It's just Paris Grant. And he's an incredible, young, zealous disciple, a lot like Travis Pope or Brandon oh, yeah. Bebos or Emmanuel. I mean, a lot like... Paul Wessels, I know, just got to get fired up. This guy gets baptized. He comes out of the waters. He's like, I got to do everything and anything for my God. He reads the Bible in three months. I look at him, I say, bro, I can barely read the Bible in 12. <laughs> he then calls me, he goes, bro, I'm so fired up for God. I, I used to want to be a financial advisor and I've got all this money from all this stuff he used to do. I'm not going to say how much, but it's a good amount. And I looked at him, I said, you, 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 what, okay, what do you want to do? Uh, how do I put myself on staff? Because all I want to do is build God's holy nation. Now, it's because he got the foundation in his heart that he was able to do something like that. But some of you guys aren't called to that. Some of you guys need to be more excellent at work, more excellent at school, and get your heart right with the Lord so you can bring that foundation into all the things you do. Right. Whether it's marriage or parenting or work, whatever it may be, the concept of Paris's heart is because he made the word of God deeply embedded in his heart, he was able to do something powerful like put himself on staff with $30,000. And I said, amen, that's just a chunk. And then he goes, man, I'm ready to do this. I'm ready to go on a mission team. So I said, oh my gosh, uh, by the way, I need another guy for Atlanta. I'm down, I'm there. Wow. Pray about it for a day. I'm down, but I'll pray. And the next day he says, I'm down because grace was found in the ground of Paris's heart. He's coming to Atlanta in December. <laughs> And it just inspires me because the word of God was in his heart. See, the word of God needs to be in your heart. Don't be a worshiper that only worships in spirit. You got to worship in spirit and in truth. And what is the truth? The word of God. You cannot be a true worshiper if you don't have the word in your life every single day. Yeah. You know, of course, we understand that the word is like a seed, right? But so is sin. Sin is a lot like a seed. If you've got sin in your life and you're not dealing with it, it's going to keep on growing. But it's not like a plant, like a beautiful pine tree. It's not like a flower. It's a weed. If you don't tend to it, that, that grows real fast. It starts taking over your whole life. James 1 says, don't just listen to what the word of God, do what it says. That's the only way for the word of God to truly get into your heart is when you read it and you do it. Now, go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 with me. And this is where we start going back and forth in Hebrews, and we really start looking at how they loosened on their convictions and how the author of Hebrews wants to strengthen their conviction. So Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, uh, we're actually going to start in verse 14, a little running start. It says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the glory of God and that no bitter root Grows up to cause trouble or defile many. Bitter root. What's a root? It's under the tree. It's in the ground. Bitterness comes in a lot of different forms. Some of us have bitter toward our past, toward our moms and dads, toward how we were treated, how we were raised. Some of us are bitter at our current lifestyle and what we've gone through. And bitterness comes out in a lot of different ways. Sadness, anger, fear, it doesn't matter. It's still bitterness. It's a root. And God's saying, you've got to see to it. You got to see to it that those bitter roots don't grow to defile you or those around you because it's in your heart where the grace of God is found. You've got to get those bitter roots out and plant the scriptures in there so you can grow in the Lord. And where does sin happen first? In the ground of your heart. It doesn't happen on the outside. Well, where should the word of God be? In the ground of your heart. That's why it is so important, young and old and mature and immature disciples to be in your scriptures every single day. Can you take up the challenge to read your Bible in three months from Genesis to the end of Revelation? I want to inspire you. Do it. It's very challenging for me. It's very challenging for you. But imagine what your life will be like if you do it. The word will be planted deep in your heart. If you're not there, at least read a chapter to five every day. Because that's where the word starts transforming your mind and your heart. Have your quiet time, not only because you have to, but because you want to. Yeah. It's important to you. You know you need it, so you read it. Have your quiet time with zeal and excitement. I love seeing Alex while he's dancing in the back. Yeah. I want to encourage you to have that same level of zeal while you have your quiet time. Come on, bro. 
That's how the word gets deeper and deeper into your heart, into your innermost being. And all of a sudden you start seeing some crazy things through the powerful grace of God happening through your life. You can't do that if sin is deep in your heart. You got to get sin out by getting deep in your scriptures and obeying them. So let me give you one practical on how to get the word of God deep in your heart. And it comes from Hebrews chapter six and verse one. A lot of you are going, well, how do I get the word of God deep in my heart? Well, let's go into the Bible, and it always answers your questions. Therefore, let us move on beyond the first principles about Christ and being taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and faith in God. Instruction about baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. And the church is super fired up about that. And what he's saying is, look, the first principles have been stripped from your church, from your life, and you've forgotten simple principles like repentance. Some disciples literally go, I can be a Christian without repentance. Well, that's the false doctrine of the world. Come as you are. It's a false doctrine. Right. Don't come as you are, repent and come as Christ calls you to be. That's the concepts that are out there in the world. The foundation of the world has been twisting the scriptures since 200 years ago, I believe, more than that, where they literally say, you're saved by faith alone. Just come as you are. Yeah, you are saved by faith, but faith in what? The word of God. Yeah. A lot of the times you walk around campus and you hear those guys talking about you're saved by faith, yeah. but they can't tell you how you're saved. They can't go to the scriptures like you guys can and will and do every single day. And that's not a knock on everybody else. That's for you to see you are part of God's holy nation. And the first principles are the foundation. So the first thing of getting the word in your heart is you have to repent every day. You can't allow sin in your life anymore. You've got to repent. You've got to let that sin out of your heart. How do you do that? Well, number one, I want to call you to have a quiet time on these three scriptures tomorrow. First John chapter one, amen, that talks about confession, being open, being in the light. Second scripture, John 3, 19 through 21, talks about how you cannot follow Jesus if you're in the darkness. And it's a concept of salvation. So this is a principle that's in the scriptures. You must repent and be made into a disciple before being saved. The third scripture, study out the first section of second Corinthians chapter seven. Repentance is a foundation of God's holy nation. And as we know in Acts, repentance is refreshing. Okay, now on Tuesday, have a quiet time on these scriptures. The second seed is sound doctrine. What you believe turns into what you do. The first scripture of study would be Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 4, and chapter 2, verse 1. And you have to go deep. Why? I'm not, I'm not just going to give you all the answers. God's going to give you the answers during your morning time with God. It's a whole practical. Okay, you got to go deep into why that has to do with sound doctrine. The disciples in Hebrews were losing conviction on the scriptures. And that's what's important. Disciples, we cannot lose conviction on the scriptures. Study out Hebrews 13, 7. And then Hebrews 19, or 10, 19 through 22. I'll go a little bit slower. Hebrews 13, 7. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22, and then Hebrews 3, 1 through 6. This is the concept of doctrine. It branches from there. If you believe in what the scriptures are saying, you will be set free when you do what the scriptures are saying. But if you don't know what the scriptures are saying and you're guessing on what the scriptures are saying just based off of what people are saying, you don't know what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> just keeps going down and we got to get conviction. We got to know before we glow and before we glow, we got to show the rhymes keep on coming. So now we have the word of God deep in our hearts through awesome in-depth quiet times, getting the seed in there, getting the roots of sin out of our hearts. We know we are the temple of God. We have to understand that the temple needs to build up the temple. So now the word of God is in my heart. Now I got to go to Steve and get the word of God in his heart. Point number two, biblical discipleship is found in biblical relationships. A lot of people go, well, I can have God, but I don't need the church. Well, false doctrine because the church needs you. 
Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give accounts. Oh, baby, you can't hide anything from God. And the cool thing about discipleship is when you truly disciple one another with the living word of God, you can't hide anything from the kingdom of God. Why? Because we're getting into the word with you. And a lot of people don't like that, so they run away. Well, that means they're not a part of the nation in the first place. You've got to stay close to God and therefore call others to be close to the Lord Almighty. Amen. Amen. Discipling needs to be daily as much as possible in a loving, gracious, patient way. Discipling digs out one thing. Sin. If you're not being discipled in your life and you're claiming Christianity, how can you say you're a Christian if you don't really do what the Bible says and discipling one another and getting discipled? You got to have it. Every disciple needs those weekly D times. My question is, how have your D times been? And a lot of us go, well, my discipler is just not equipped enough. Well, it's your role to equip them by asking them all those questions to get them stronger. <laughs> Young disciples, you got to go to your disciple and ask a thousand questions before you get one real answer. But a lot of us don't have the humility to ask all those questions. Discipling is a literal, biblical, foundational principle that if you don't have it, you lose the kingdom. You start getting big blogs of people who sing really well, who have really cool lights and a lot of money, and all of a sudden nobody is a real Christian because nobody's getting true discipling. It's uncomfortable. It's weird when I have to talk about my sin and you're bringing it out and I'm sitting there like, oh, what do I do with my life? And the brother's like, bro, you just got to look at the scriptures. And Steve's like, bro, you just got to look at the scriptures. It's part of discipleship. Now let's go to Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 1. And get into more of the OT in, in concept of bringing life to one another. And uh, Ezekiel 37, verse 1, hopefully you give me about 8 to 10 more minutes. Is that cool? Okay, the hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley. You guys remember where Moses was on top of the mountain? God says, hey, Ezekiel, you might have more faith than Moses. You're going to the valley. And the valley is a dark place. That's where they threw a lot of dead bodies, a lot of the blood, a lot of wars happened in valleys. So Ezekiel's like, no! And he's sitting there, and the Spirit of God carried him there. Yeah. See, a lot of the times, disciples are being carried by the Holy Spirit into valleys, and you don't know how to handle it. That's why you need discipling, because people help you while you're in the valley. You can't handle the valley by yourself. Biblical discipleship is found in biblical relationships. So here he is in the middle of the valley, and guess what it was full of? It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. You ever felt like that happening in your Bible talk, in your households, in your church services where the bones, and you're there? What do I do? How do I handle this? I said, sovereign alone, sovereign Lord alone, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. He doesn't say, sing this song or go out and get some ice cream. He doesn't say, hey, hang out with me for three hours. Hey, let's go to Banana Republic and get a brand new shirt. No, he says, hear the word of the Lord. Some of you guys got so much pride in your life that you don't even know how to hear the Bible anymore. Wow. It's boring to you. You think you're cool. You think you're studly. You, you got all this pride and you don't even know that God's trying to get to your insides. And you got unhappiness and depression and you take this medicine it's fine but imagine if god was your joy because you hear his voice again because you want to know him see it's cool to know all the rap songs it's even cooler to know the word of god Amen. it's cool to know the lyrics it's even cooler to live by the spirit Amen. what spirit are you living by today the one that brings you death and bones life keep reading with me this is what the sovereign lord says to these bones i will make breath enter you and you will come to life 
I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound and bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath. Then he said, prophesy to the breath, son of man, say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. Come on, bro. What is it that brought them to life? The word of God. He said, preach the word, Ezekiel. Preach the word to those dead bones. And they came to life. It started with some rattling. You know, when I hear rattling, I think there's an issue going on. It's hard to get through the rattle. But you got to break through so you can start seeing things build together. It is difficult to preach in love through the hardships. There's dead bones everywhere, and you got to do it through your relationship with God and your relationship with one another. So when you have D times, when you preach to one another, when you bring life to each other, you got to preach the word. You got to declare it. It's not boring. It's amazing. You got to have D times that encourage and bring life to each other. You can team this passage with Ephesians 5.19, where it talks about speaking through the Spirit, speaking in hymns and songs. And you got to really build deep relationship on a core level. Some of you guys are blocking people out. You're not letting discipling in. So you feel alone. You feel out of culture. You feel dead. All those things. Guess what? Simple repentance. Preach the word and let the word be preached into your heart. When you preach with faith, beyond your past, your present, and the future, through the word of God, it is living. Behind the pulpit or one-on-one in discipling or in relationships, there's some brewing of life happening. It brings life. So let me tell you a story about my beautiful wife, Tia, and her little sister, Alexa. Last December, Alexa talked maybe every other day about wanting to commit suicide when we went home for Christmas time. And we looked at her and we said, oh, that's our heart. That's our baby. We saw her growing up. Tia Tia literally raised her. And I've known her since, what, 13, 14, 10. And she's talking about committing suicide. And she's she's in kids' kingdom. She knows the kingdom. And it's like, what happened? The world started defining her mind. Started listening to that stuff that you shouldn't listen to. Started doing the things you shouldn't do. And the spirit of the world started taking over her heart making her depressed and sad and alone. Even though she was around the kingdom all the time, she was still alone. So T and I went over there for Christmas and we sat down and even though Christmas, you get a lot of gifts. Alexa, I think you need that one gift. The only one that matters. You don't know what that is, but we want to start by inviting you to live with us so you can get right with God. We talked to Tia's beautiful, awesome disciple parents. They allowed Alexa to move in with us. In uh, January, Tia constantly prayed in tears for her little sister. You can see by her face, she was, she was 16, but she looked like she was 20-something. Just the hurt and the pain that was going on in her life, the thoughts of suicide just destroyed her. And you, and you can see it, but Tia kept praying for her, kept calling out to God, kept preaching the word. The sisters got in there. We said, you got to let those girls in. So she let her in, let the girls in more life started coming. Her bones started rattling. You started seeing her smile. She never smiled. And they were like, oh, baby, God's working. Tia sat down with her, had D time after D time after conversation after conversation. I'm sitting here weeping because I see the beauty of discipling relationships. I think it was February, middle February. Alexa says, I want to be a disciple. There's no hope in this world. And Tia and I sat there in tears, and finally she does the cross study, the church study. She goes, there's nothing else in this world that matters. I want to be a disciple. I want to be baptized by Tia and Melanie. I want my life to change. She gets baptized into Christ, comes out with the biggest smile you are ever seen in your life. No longer has suicidal thoughts. No longer depressed. The most fired up disciple. She's an intern, and she's going to Atlanta with us and wants to do great things for God. Filled with joy, filled with life, 
covered with skin and she's alive again and some of you need that. Some of you are dead in the world and you think it's bringing you life and comfort, but it's not. Only God's word can bring you life. The spirit will do the power lifting family. You just got to preach the word, preach the word and your daily discipling relationships. Preach the word to your families and your friends. Never lose sight of what the true foundation of God's church is, the word of God. I'm running out of time, but I want to teach you about the concepts of friendships real fast. Let's go to 1 Samuel 18, verse 1, teamed up with uh, Hebrews chapter 14, verse 14, 12, verse 14 through 15. But it was funny because I actually had a conversation with one of my great friends, Bill Stafford. And he, uh, he mentioned David and uh, Jonathan. And this is actually one of my points. And this, is, this point is actually an honor of Bill Stafford. Oh, Part of relationships is that it gets hard. Friendship is not easy. Friendship takes devotion and dedication yeah. and openness. First Samuel 18, verse 1. After David, verse 1, it says, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. What's really cool about this passage is the two of them became one on the inside and it showed on the outside. Disciples, you got to be one with God on the inside and then one with one another on the inside. How you think about each other, how you feel about each other determines how you're going to treat each other. David and Jonathan got it. They understood friendship and love and dedication. What's really cool is the name David means beloved. In other words, Jonathan means gift of God. Put the two of them together, their relationship was a beloved gift of God. On a Bible talk level, a lot of us feel distant. Feel like, man, these aren't my friends, but you got to see them as your beloved gift of God. Yeah. Bible talk leaders, those who are in Bible talks, those who are in the small groups, you got to understand these are your beloved gifts of God. You can't be distant from anybody in the kingdom of God because that's yeah, Satan's that's plan. Right. There's somebody in this room that you don't feel close to because of the color of their skin. You better repent. Come on, bro. You better repent because that is not going to be in heaven. Number two, if there's somebody in this room that you're not close to because of their stature financially, you better repent. Yeah. Come on, bro. That is not in the kingdom of God. There's no rich or poor in the kingdom. There's tremendously rich in the kingdom of God. Come on, bro. Number three, if you're not close to somebody because of their educational status, Repent. That is not in the kingdom of God because we're all unschooled and ordinary compared to Jesus Christ. You got to see Naomi and Ruth relationships as well. Naomi and Ruth were great friends. Naomi means pleasantness. Ruth means friend. Pleasant friends. You got to be close to each other. You got to see each other as pleasant friends, gifts of God, beloved. And that's how a Bible talk truly shows the love of God because they plant the word of God in their own hearts. And then they plant it in each other's hearts because they see each other as beloved gifts of God. You know, the Bible talk that you've been blessed with is filled with beloved gifts and blessed, pleasant friendships. I got to talk about last night a little bit and then I'll close out. Um, last night I had a little bit of a stomach ache and I had drank some tea or some stuff that really hurt my stomach. And then I ate some chicken from Gator Dockside because it was the Gator game and we crushed every, uh, crushed the team, but I had to eat some chicken. And then all of a sudden my stomach started hurting. And I sat there and Kathy Bell was there such a tremendous time talking to her about her family and all her friends. And I was like, oh, I hope I'm encouraging. She seemed encouraged. And then I came out and I looked at Joe Mac attack and I said, my brother, my stomach hurts. <laughs> but I want to smash you at some Halo. <laughs> Played Halo and I won. Yeah. <laughs> and then the brothers came in and the sisters came in. There was some Monopoly going on. I saw Steve's face while he played Kahari and, and Angelica and one other person. They just looked at each other. They're about to really hurt each other. I said, guys, <laughs> it's only Monopoly. And then um, Kahari was for sure going to win. So just like the UF game, I got a little bit bored watching it because it was just an annihilation. So I walked away from the game. And then I came back and... and and Steve was like, I can't believe it. I'm like, what? Angelica won. <laughs> like, how does that happen? So Angelica took the Monopoly championship and they're celebrating together. And then there was an Uno championship going on. So Joe was crying in the corner because I took his trophy. I was kidding, he wasn't. 
I saw Angelica. We are the champion, my friend. Da, da, da. Kahari on the ground, like, why? But then the Uno was intense, right? So you should have saw Annie, right? So, I'm, 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 I'm. And then you saw Steven, like, whoop, whoop, whoop. And then my wife, like, ah, ah, well, bam. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then Andrea comes in, like, whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> the silent assassin. And then Steven's like, these rules, man, these rules. Oh, yeah. I was like, oh, okay, bro, the rules are why you're losing. He's like, and, I, and actually, I said it out loud. And he goes, actually, I won. So Steven won the Uno game, but he didn't like the rules. So amen about that. And it was just a tremendous amount of joy and fun. And then Joe comes in with teriyaki on top of broccoli and mushrooms and the young men were like what is this concoction of death and the sisters were like that's really good for you <laughs> so i took one of those mushrooms and i said to the glory of god i ate it and it was one of the best things i've ever had in my life and then i took the broccoli and i ate it it's one of the best things in my life then i took them together and it was literally one of the best things of my life and everybody was ranting and raving about the teriyaki broccoli and mushrooms now this is not even the the the, the cherry on top and the food was delicious burgers were good amelia was serving her face off all the sisters it was just a time of unity but then we came together and we sang some kingdom songs and we got vulnerable and we shared, what is your greatest weakness? And how do you respond when that weakness is illuminated or exposed? Tears, laughs, depth. And I asked, do you feel closer to each other? And they were like, yes. So now we're going to share what makes us feel joyful. And then we all shared in a circle the things that make us feel the most joyful. And all of us were laughing and tears were being shed. And then we got to Angelica and she literally says, it was really special. All of all the sharing was special. I just remember Angelica's and she says she cried and she said, I'm just grateful for the kingdom of God. I'm grateful for my friendships. I didn't have them in the world. I didn't have this life. I love the kingdom. And it wasn't tears of sadness or guilt or fear. It was tears of joy. Yeah, that's right. And it was just a moment. Guys, that is the core of the Gainesville Church. Amen. that depth of love that depth of friendship that relationship it's here and i see it in this sunday service i want to challenge you guys on a bible talk level to have biblical discipleship biblical relationships so you can have a foundation of god but let us close with one last point and it's hebrews 10 verse 23 through 25 and it's not a point it's actually just a scripture by the way uh, yeah <laughs> hebrews 10 23 through 25 it reads, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Where's the hope at in our hearts and who do we profess it to? One another. Amen. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, yes. not giving up meeting together as some of you are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. How often do you need to be a disciple every day? Right. How often do your friends and family in this church need to be a disciple every day? How often should we encourage one another every day? Right. So my challenge to the Bible talk leaders and those in Bible talks is you have have to have daily relationships with one another not just on tuesday nights but call each other disciple each other brothers sisters sisters brothers sisters sisters every single day you've got to be sold out because how can a bible talk evangelize the world daily daily be in the word get the word of god and the foundations of your heart point number one point number two get the word of god and the foundations of your family's hearts and then point number three get it to the ends of the earth by doing this daily with each other i promise you at the end of the day when jesus comes back if you live according to this biblical foundation you will go up with him in glory alongside everybody in your Bible talk. Guys, let's build the holy nation through God's biblical foundation. Love you guys. <laughs>